tour of four key Pacific allies. But one of the greatest Pacific powers is right here in the United States, right where we're broadcasting from. That's right, California. With a $2 trillion economy, it is the world's eighth biggest, bigger than South Korea, Malaysia, and the Philippines combined, bigger even than Russia's economy. And when President Obama held his first major summit with China's new leader, Xi Jinping, it took place here in California. It is a magnet for visiting world leaders, from Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu to Egypt's deposed President Mohamed Morsi, who received his doctoral degree from the University of Southern California. Morsi, of course, has since gone from president to prisoner, and later in the program we'll talk with one of Egypt's presidential candidates vying to replace him in elections next month. But first, we dive into California's once troubled, now calming waters with the man who seems to have pulled off an administrative miracle, Governor Jerry Brown. This state that has powered so much American innovation seemed to have run off the rails in the last decade. It was ground zero for America's devastating housing bubble that fueled the 2008 global recession. And its elected officials were paralyzed by a monstrous $27 billion budget deficit. For good and for ill, what happens here in California impacts the world. The man behind this state's revival is, of course, Governor Jerry Brown. At 36 years old, he was one of California's youngest governors when he first served back in the 1970s. And now he's California's oldest, and he's not done yet as he aims for an unprecedented fourth term. This idiosyncratic leader who wrestled, wrestled recalcitrant legislators and taxpayers into making the really tough choices, join me from the state capital, Sacramento, for an exclusive interview to explain just how he did it. Governor Jerry Brown, welcome to our program. Thank you. You, to mix all the metaphors, are the turnaround kid in the comeback state. It wasn't so long ago that California was being uttered in the same breath as Spain and Greece during the worst of the economic recession over, uh, overseas. And now it's turned around. How did you plug and now have a surplus, a $26 billion deficit? Is it just the economy or did you do something special? Well, it is the economy, but we did something special. We cut programs, uh, programs dear to liberals, programs dear to conservatives and builders, uh, the university, child care, a host of very good programs uh, we had to reduce because the money wasn't there. And we faced the music, we took our medicine. In addition to that, I asked the people of California to vote in a, uh, a voter referendum called an initiative to raise uh, the income tax on the highest earners and to raise the sales tax a quarter of a cent on everyone else. And that passed uh, with a very strong majority. And so between the cuts, the taxes, and the, in, uh, the inherent uh, vibrancy and recovery of the California economy, we are now in a surplus position, whereas before, as you indicate, we were being compared with failed states. So what about the failed state of Washington, D.C., the dysfunctional state of affairs in Congress, between uh, Congress and the White House? They can't even get a budget together. Is there any lesson from California for the wider country, or did you benefit from having a Democratic majority everywhere you looked? That's the point. Uh, we not only have a majority of my party, but we have majority rule in terms of our budget, both the spending and the cuts, uh, that's a majority. We don't have a 60% rule, uh, and we're not a house divided. Uh, we know uh, that a house divided really can't make it for too long. Uh, but beyond all that, uh, there is uh, almost willful inability on the part of the uh, extreme elements uh, there in, in Congress to come together. So uh, I think it's very disquieting. Uh, we see problems in Europe and Asia. Uh, in the world economy, but uh, I think one of the biggest problems is the growing dysfunctionality and therefore the impairment uh, of the leadership role of the United States. And on the course they're on now in Washington, uh, these two political parties are not coming together in the way that will arrest the decline uh, that seems ominous to me.
This is such an important state with such a massive economy compared to whole countries abroad. And yet, we know uh, Hispanics will be a majority population in this country. The language will be the dominant language in this country. And yet, Hispanics are falling between the cracks when it comes to education, even here in California and around the Southwest. I mean, really lamentable. How is it going to be possible to make sure that this new majority is going to have the tools to enact their numbers and their responsibilities? Well, first of all, the Latino community is uh, growing in numbers uh, at our universities. Uh, secondly, by raising the minimum wages where uh, a lot of Hispanic people are, that will contribute to family stability. So ensuring the health care, the educational opportunity, the minimum wage, we've now given the right uh, to drive a car, even though people are not uh, documented. We're going to do all that we can, but we do need a national turn, and that takes the Republicans as well, that we recognize our future is with uh, so much with our immigrants as well as our native peoples, and together uh, we have to focus on bolstering uh, the human beings and the kids and taking care uh, of our human resource needs. And, and we're not doing that. I mean, I have no doubt about it. In fabled state. Los Angeles is a fabled city. And yet, statewide, some 60% of your roads and highways are in lamentable condition. Traffic is obviously terrible. You yourself have taken on the idea of infrastructure very seriously. You want to build a major initiative for a bullet train. But it's become incredibly unpopular. Given the fact that infrastructure is so prominent and, 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 and works so well in Europe, first of all, why are people making fun of your bullet train initiative? And secondly, can you even afford it given the draconian cuts you've made okay. in other vital services? Well, first of all, there are some people making fun of everything. Uh, so that's just the way life is and uh, we take that. Uh, secondly, it's not really unpopular. It's, uh, you know, the different surveys show different things, maybe uh, a 45 percent approval. I mean, in many parts of Europe, uh, very few governments ever enjoy a 45 percent approval. So uh, there's uh, the, the money for it was voted, at least uh, 13 billion of it, uh, by the people. Uh, we have money uh, from the federal government. Uh, yes, it takes boldness. But ever since the gold rush, uh, people have been coming to California because it is a place of dreams. And if 16 other countries can build a high-speed rail, California can, and we are. In terms of these roads, yeah, we need to uh, have repairs. But remember, we have more Nobel laureates. Just in the first quarter of 2014, 60% of all the venture capital investment in America was invested in California. This is the place of Google and Apple and Hewlett Packard. Uh, yeah, we're going to have some problems, but it's a two trillion dollar economy. Uh, we're, uh, if we're, we're a nation state, we'd be the eighth uh, richest in the world. So we're doing a lot of stuff. In fact, I'm uh, personally interviewing that for the state, doing uh, memorandums of understanding with China, with Israel, uh, with British Columbia uh, in terms of climate change. So we solve our problems. Uh, we have the successes. We have failures. That's part of life. But boy. California is still an exciting place, and to be the governor here uh, is one that I really cherish, and we will chip away at each of these issues that uh, are being brought up, and I think we'll be successful. Let me talk about your personal self. Do you think you will ever run for president again? You are going to run for uh, an unprecedented fourth term as governor. After that, what? Well, after that, I'll be 80. So uh, what offices I may seek then, I think I should exercise a bit of restraint and perhaps a, a touch of wisdom. Governor, people used to, I think, very affectionately call you Governor Moonbeam. Do you feel that you have put that title aside with all the successes that you've had over the last several years? Well, in some ways, I feel I've earned that moniker because of the creativity, the and yes, the unpredictability, but what we've been able to do. California is the leader in America in solar energy, in uh, efficient buildings, in the number of electric cars, in venture capital, uh, in climate change uh, actions. So we do a lot, but if you do a lot, you also have to fail a lot. 
And we learned in Silicon Valley that those who fail go on to create even greater successes. If you're fearful, well, you may not stumble, but you don't create anything monumental. So uh, I think a lot's going on here. I, I feel excited to have the opportunity to uh, serve a, a fourth term. No one's ever done that. No one will ever do it.